Ethiopia. Verse 20, 1 Corinthians 15 and 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead mm -hmm. and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Right. For as in Adam all die, mm -hmm. even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. I want to talk this morning on the Lord of the kingdom. The Lord of the kingdom. God created mankind to rule. But man gave up his rule when Satan tricked him in the garden. So the providence of God allowed for the reclaiming of the rule that man had been given on earth. When I was a teenager, I worked for a man that put trust in me. At the age of 16, he let me keep his car over the weekend. He allowed me to drive it to school. I washed that car. I waxed that car. I drove it proudly and parked it in the driveway of my parents' house. I walked in the house twirling the keys on my finger as if the car was mine. I got beside myself because the car was a good car. It looked good. It drove good. But my mother reminded me as she had a way of doing it, that the car wasn't mine. She said, remember, you're just managing what someone else has worked for. Well, I said that to say this, that God owned a house called a garden in Eden, in which he placed Adam and Eve in, in order to oversee and manage it. They didn't own it, but they were given the freedom to use it, to enjoy it, to maximize it. In fact, they were given great freedom with only one restriction. Do not eat of the tree in the midst or the middle of the garden. That's right, that's right. <laughs> but because Satan wanted to make himself the owner, he got Adam to intentionally rebel against God. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14, the Bible later reminds us that it was not Adam that was deceived, but the woman was deceived. Adam went into his sin with his eyes wide open. Because of his rebellion against God, the crown that God had placed on him was removed. Adam turned over the rulership of earth to the devil. To put it in football language, Adam was carrying the ball. Serpent, the serpent tackled him and he fumbled the ball. And the devil recovered the fumble. Y'all gonna work with me this morning. The earthly rule that was supposed to be operating under the heavenly rule was transferred, but there was one problem. God had committed himself to only work through mankind to bring about his kingdom rule in history. Since Adam would not cooperate with God, God used the second Adam. Mm -hmm. All right. First Corinthians, we read, for since by man came death, yeah, yeah. by man also came the resurrection 
of the dead. Right. For as in Adam, uh -huh. the Bible says all die. All die. So also in Christ yes, sir. shall all be made alive. Yeah. And then in verse 45 of this chapter we read, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, yeah. became a living soul. Yes, but the last Adam yeah. became a life-giving spirit. Yeah. If you want to understand all history, you need to understand one word, and that is Adam. There is Adam number one. And then there's Adam number two. Yeah. And through both of them is found the summation of all of history. All of this is possible, possible because the second Adam, Jesus Christ, came to redeem the dominion that the first Adam lost through sin. Amen. Romans 5, 19 through 21. For as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of the one, many would be made righteous. Amen. So as uh, sin reigned in death, grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When the first Adam rebelled against God, the Bible tells us that death fell upon all of us. Yeah. We all die. all die. I don't care how in shape you are. Right. All right. We all die. Yes, sir. Right. I don't care how much you work out. Right. We all die. Yes, yes. Brother Mac, I take all my multivitamins. That's good, and you should. <laughs> Brother Mac, I watch what I eat. That's good, and you should. But we all yes. die. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Some live longer than others. That's right. But we all are going to die. Yes, ah, when the first Adam rebelled against God, the Bible says that death fell upon all of us. Right. His destiny was imputed to us as the destiny of the human race because each one of us is in Adam. Okay. Yet God gave a prophecy in Genesis chapter 3 that would turn things around. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman yeah, yeah. and between your seed yeah. and her seed. Yeah. He shall bruise you right. on the head uh -huh. and you shall bruise him on the heel. All right. Genesis 3.15. What, what is interesting to note in this verse is how God chose to phrase this thing. Normally, when talking about a seed, we talk about the seed of a man. Uh, Y'all not helping me. Uh, it is the male gender that carries the seed while the female gender carries the egg. Yeah. God had determined to do something new. He determined to do a unique thing and produce it. A human being without the seed of a human man. But rather with the seed of a woman connected to his own identity. And through this he would create the perfect God man, Jesus Christ. Who would then provide another opportunity for regaining the rulership that was lost by the first Adam. I'm trying to get somebody. I grew up in the Dallas area. Terrell, Texas to be exact. It's a small place. And I was into the Dallas Cowboys big time growing up. I knew all the stats. I knew as much about the players as any fan at 12 years old could know. Roger Staubach was my quarterback. Drew Pearson was my receiver. And then Tony Dorsett was my childhood hero. I would take a sock and ball it up like a football. And I would jog through the house like I was Tony Dorsett. I would dream that I was uh, Dorsett in the football games. I was always the hero in the game and scored the winning touchdown. I won more playoff games and Super Bowls in my mind 
at the age of 12, 13, and 14 than any uh, kid in that area. I thought I was as good as Tony Dorsett, Drew Pearson, and the rest of those guys. I mentioned earlier that we have Brother Andre Anderson uh, in service today, and uh, he played with the Cowboys of my youth. And what is even better than that is that he's a member of the body of Christ. So we're all on the same team. Team Jesus. Is that all right? Having had a conversation with him months earlier, we got to talking and I shared with him uh, my growing up days not really knowing that he was on that team that I grew up admiring. And he said, maybe one day you get a chance to talk with Mr. Tony Dorsey. Would you like that? I almost fell out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Andre and I have been talking and communicating, and he facilitated a call between I and Tony Dorsey last week. And I wanted to talk to Mr. Dorsett because he is suffering from CTE disease, meaning that he had taken some very vicious hits as a result of being a lot of people's hero. And he's suffering right now with a disease in his brain that is causing him a lot of struggle. So Andre, who's sitting in the back, just wave your hand, Andre. God bless you. Uh, made it happen. Through a conference call, I was able to talk with Tony Dorsett. And it was basically to tell him how he allowed a 12-year-old boy to dream big. How he made it all right to come from a small place, but to dream big things. It may not mean much to you, but it means a lot to me to be where I was from to be where I am now, still dreaming after all these years. And what I wanted him to know was that we're praying for you. And he told me, Mr. Dorsett said, keep those prayer warriors praying. So I want to tell you to keep praying for individuals who ask for our prayers. Because you never know you never know what may happen. Yeah. Now we're going to send this CD uh, to Mr. Dorsett. And we want him to know, as we want everybody to know, that God loves him. And that we're praying for him. That he would be able to work this thing out in his mind that he's dealing with. Because we're all dealing with something. His struggle may not be your struggle. And your struggle may not be his struggle. But we're all struggling with something. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Yeah. Ah, and, and this, 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 this. I'm going to tie this in with my lesson, too. Yeah. Studying the Cowboys, I learned that they had a play called the fly pattern. Yeah. In which the receiver would run down the field. While the quarterback threw the ball along in order to try and score a touchdown, Brother Anthony. In one play. However, when the Cowboys called a fly pattern, they would also call a waggle play. And the waggle play involved a halfback who would peel off to the side in case the quarterback got in trouble. And didn't have time to throw the fly pattern down the field. This gave the quarterback another option in case the defense decided to blitz and keep him from throwing the long pass. The quarterback could toss the ball to the halfback if he couldn't go way downfield. Somebody say, where are you going? Where are you going with it? When God created Adam, God called a fly pattern. He set Adam in motion to run down the field of the kingdom of God. Go for the touchdown, but Satan decided that he wanted to blitz and snuck into the backfield and tried to interrupt the play. But with what Satan didn't bank on was that God always has a plan. If a man refuses to cooperate with the plan, God still has 
a plan. So he tossed the ball to the second Adam. And the second Adam was Jesus Christ. Because the first Adam fumbled the ball. Jesus Christ carried. Ah, ah, this was in purpose. And Satan heard about it in Genesis 3.15. That would come through the seed of a woman. So he sets out on a quest to kill the seed. First, his influence gets into Cain to kill Abel. But God then enabled Eve to give birth to another seed, Seth. After Satan seeks to inhabit the seed of mankind, man is evil in his thoughts continually. Man is just wilding out in the world, just going nuts in the world. It got so bad that God's patience destroyed all of humanity except for the family of Noah. And essentially the entire Old Testament is a story of the back and forth. The seed is born. Satan makes a counter move to kill the seed. But by the end of the Old Testament, we come into a 400 year period of silence. And this eventually ended in the New Testament when God begins this portion of his word by giving us the genealogy of the seed of Jesus Christ. God would use a man and use a man to advance the kingdom on earth. But now God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. Through the virgin birth, he provided the opportunity for earth to become realigned with him and his kingdom. Y'all all right out there? In Jesus, heaven and earth can be unified. And the reason Pharaoh issued a decree to kill all the newborn males in the land in the time of Moses' birth is the same reason that Herod issued a decree to kill every boy under the age of two at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. Satan once again is working now behind the scenes. The instigator of lawlessness. The first lawbreaker and the inspiration for all other lawbreakers. The opposer of every law of nature by developing unnatural methods and practices. This is the one who's working now behind the scenes. The rejecter of decency and orderliness by creating division and dissension. The discourager of modesty and morality through enticing lust and lasciviousness He's the repeller of goodness and mercy who injects bitterness and jealousy. The detester of every element of peace and justice by enticing disrespect and dishonesty. I'm talking about the one working behind the scene tries to get rid of the prophetic seed of Genesis 3.15. But I drop by to tell you that his attempts will fail. Are y'all on the line? Through Jesus. Able to live a sinless life. Rise from the dead. Ascend into heaven. And claim the kingdom that the first Adam had seeded over to Satan. Through the power of the cross and resurrection, Jesus Christ has ultimate authority in our world today. God knows that. And Satan knows that. But guess what? Satan doesn't want you to know that. So what, 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 what Satan does is try to intimidate you and pressure you, lie to you, and do anything else he can to try to get kingdom followers to believe that he still has power over them, but the devil is still alive. Yeah. And so many people are not living lives that are reflective of the kingdom of God is that they have lost sight of the reality of the cross. Jesus deactivated and dismantled and disarmed Satan's headship by stripping him of the ball called authority, which Satan had recovered from the first Adam, but lost it with the second one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's lost already. 
really the game for him is over. But but he wants to intimidate you into thinking that uh, 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 you must follow him in order to get what you want. It'll be over in a minute. God has given ultimate authority over what happens in history to his son. Amen, church. And where he has placed that authority. Let's, let's turn to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, uh, 22 and 23. In, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, uh, verses 22 and 23, the Bible said, and he put what? All things. He put what? All things. All things. Under his feet. Where are they? Under his feet. They are under his, his feet. What else? And gave him to be. Gave who to be? Gave him to be. Gave Christ to be what? The head. He's the what church? The head. Say it again with me. The head. He's the head. Over all things. Over all things. To the church. To the church. Which is his body. Which is his body. What else? The fullness of him. The fullness of him. That filleth all in all. That fills all in all. Amen. So we confuse the terms power and authority. Stay with me. Satan still has power. Amen. He does. He still dominates the world in which we live and influences people's lives in countless ways. You must be careful. You're not dealing with one that doesn't know who you are. You must be careful because he knows where you struggle. He knows your weakness. He knows what upsets you. He knows what you like and what you don't like. And he will use those things to try and manipulate you into doing what he wants you to do. He still has power. All right. His tactics and destruction are real and damaging. Amen. But what he doesn't have is final authority. Powerful? Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Final authority? No. Amen. What do you mean by that? Well, for example, a football player, they are far bigger than the referee. The referee usually is older, smaller, and more out of shape than the players. The players can knock you down in a game. That's power. But the referees can put you out of the game. That's authority. There's a difference between power and authority. Satan has power. But the only way he's free to use that power is over the lives of individuals, families, yes, even churches, or society is our failure to operate under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan does not have the authority to use his power when men function under the covering of Jesus Christ. Oh, it's getting good to me. That's why the devil is trying so hard to disrupt the church of Christ. Am I right about it? And pull us out from under the lordship of Jesus. And if he can get you out from under Christ's covering, which is our only by choice, he has free reign to do his dirty work. But you got to give it to him. That's right. You have to see it over. Now, in Colossians 1.13, Colossians 1.13 tells us that we were rescued. Thank God somebody rescued us. We were sure in need of some rescuers. Amen, somebody? Thank God the Bible says that he rescued us from the dominion. Of what? The power of uh, darkness. Uh, from the dominion or the power of darkness. Isn't that right? Yeah. And he's transferred us. Isn't that right? Yeah. Where has he transferred us? Into the kingdom he's of his dear son. Transferred us into the kingdom 
of his dear son. By rescuing us, God transferred us to live out our lives under the rule of a new king. And that king is Jesus. I used to belong to Satan's kingdom and rulership before I met Jesus Christ. But now I know what I didn't know before. And it's hard now to believe that before I met Christ, yeah. I was under the control of the author of rebellion. Yeah. Before I met Christ, yeah. I was under the control of the director of disobedience. Yeah. I said before oh. I met Christ, I was under the control of the instigator of morality yeah. and the founder of corruption. That's right. But now I know but now, what I didn't know then. Thank God, yeah. I'm no longer under the control of the invention of evil and the schema of disgrace. Now I know what I didn't know. I didn't know then, but I know now that sin breeds and is one great diss after another diss. One disrespect for the holy and a disregard for the pure is a disdain for the virtuous and a disinterest for the blessed. It's dissatisfaction with the eternal and discomfort with all of the saints. But now I know what I didn't know before. That sin puts hardness in your heart and hatred in your mind. It puts haughtiness in the attitude and hardship in the home. Now I know what I didn't know then. That sin puts hindrances in the way and heaviness in the heart. The process of sin within one's life is often revealed by the heart of indifference and the shame of shamelessness, the fires of resentment and the cancer of doubt, the loose tongue of gossip and the green eye of jealousy. But now I know what I didn't know then. Now I'm a part of a new kingdom where Jesus is the king. Titus 3 and verse 5 Not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Aren't you glad that somebody saved you? He's all I need. He's all I need to get by. In passion, he loved me. And with his grace, he saved me. With his power, he protects me. With his wisdom, he instructs me. With his word, he teaches me. With his glory, he'll crown me. And with his spirit, he empowers me. Now I know what I didn't know then. With the resurrection of Jesus, he's been made head over all rulers and all authority. And when a person accepts Christ as their sin bearer, they transfer kingdoms. You leave one kingdom for another kingdom. The first kingdom was the kingdom of darkness. Every crisis that was ever created uh -huh. and every hand that was ever defiled every standard that was ever lowered uh -huh. and every reputation that was ever damaged yeah. began in this kingdom right. this kingdom is in direct conflict uh -huh. with the kingdom of God Amen. who would ever want to stay connected to a kingdom that takes you further and further away from God right. I'm so glad that somebody taught me about another kingdom yeah. that I could come out of the old other of the kingdom yeah. and be transferred without a gift of money into the new kingdom. Yeah. Aren't you glad? Aha, uh -huh, that Christ saved you. Yeah. Thanks be to God I got out of that kingdom yeah. and I now know what I know now, uh -huh. what I didn't know then. Aha, yeah. right. uh -huh, that I can have all my sins removed through the work of God in my life. Amen. Even when we were dead yeah. in our transgressions, God made us alive together. Watch this. Watch this now. Watch it. Watch it. With Christ, by grace, by grace, you have been saved. Yeah. He lifted us. Isn't that right? Yeah. And and there's a word in there, the and there's a coordinated conjunction that 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 he lifted us, he raised us up yeah. with him. Uh -huh. And the Bible said in Ephesians 2:5, and seated us 
Yeah. Watch it. Don't miss the word and here. And raised us up. And then and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. Look at the word and. That, that three letter word is a coordinating conjunction. Conjunction. Uh, what's your function? Uh -huh. Notice what Christ did. Yes. When you were baptized yes. into Christ, yes. his grace put you yes. into a saved state. Yes. He took you in uh -huh. regardless if others have left you out. All right. He took you in. Yes, and with his action, he's saying, hey, I got you. Yeah. I got this. Yeah. Some people are for what you're for. But they're not for you. But God is also for you. In other words, he's with you and he's got you because he is for you. Amen. Amen. When someone, someone submits to Christ, Christ is saying, now you are with me. Amen. You get access because you're with me. That's right. I got you. Yeah. I got you. I got your back. I'm with you. He died. Watch this. And when he died, you died with him. When Christ rose, you rose with him. When Christ was seated at the right hand of the Father, now you see it at the right hand of the Father as well. In other words, you were made to function in concert and cadence with Jesus. Amen. So you're in step with the Lord. Yeah. And you go step by step. Yeah. Is that alright? All right. Step by step. Uh-huh. I'm in Christ. Right. Christ is with me. Yeah. He's got me. Yeah. Because he fought me. Amen. In order uh, for you to legitimately access his sovereign authority over all things and your world must be aligned underneath the headship of Jesus Christ. And it only comes when you confess Jesus, repent of your sins, and obey the command given to his apostles as he sent them out into the world. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of what? Father, Son, and in what? Spirit, Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe what? All things whatsoever I commanded you. And he said what? Lo, I'll be with you. Always, even until the end of the age. And because Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, his followers are also seated at the right hand of the Father. That's right, that's right. You got dual, dual citizenship. That's it, that's it. <sighs> Brother Maxwell, uh, you're talking about all this being seated with Christ. I'm living down here in Seattle. No, no, no. When you, when you, you were elevated. When you came up out of that pool, your sins were forgiven. Christ lifted you. Yeah, yeah. He raised you up. Amen. Is that all right? It, so in other words, uh, uh, somebody said, well, how can I be in two places at one time? Uh -huh. Well, uh, we do it all the time physically. I can be in Seattle, but I can also be on Skype with someone in Dallas. <laughs> I can be seated in my home in Seattle and participate in a meeting in Los Angeles. That's right. Through human technology, you can be in two places at one. Come on, church. Right. Don't you think the creator of the universe can do the same thing? All right. You are physically on earth, but you're supposed to be functioning from the position of heaven. Amen. Y'all work with me. The enemy tries to keep you thinking that you're bound to the rules of his kingdom uh, rather than accessing the authority of Christ in his. Amen. Yes, and I believe yes, that there's somebody has, has, has chosen to come out from under the, the, the rule of Christ and you're doing your own thing. You're doing your own thing. But, 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 but you got to line your life up with Jesus. In other words, don't come in here. Ah, help me, Holy Spirit. Help me right now. Don't act like you're under Christ's headship on Sunday. But Monday through Saturday, 
you pull it out and do it your own thing. Is that all right? Lord, they don't like this. Help me now. Uh, uh, it means that you are lined up yes, with Christ. All right. And if you say you ain't going to be a Christian, be one. Well, okay. Amen, somebody. Amen. If you're going to sing the songs of Zion, act like you want to go there by the way you live. Amen. <laughs> somebody, somebody ought to come out of the world. <laughs> Just come on out of the world. Amen. Come on out of the world. Well, well, how do you do that, preacher? You, 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 you need to come out by, by, by believing, by believing that, that Christ is able. Yeah. Yeah. Faith coming by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Confess the sweetest name on mortal tongue. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus by acknowledging him publicly. And when you confess, he said, when you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, he said, I will deny you before my Father which is in heaven. Jesus wants to run interference. He's a blocker that goes out in front before us. But Jesus won't block for you if you won't acknowledge or confess him. I'm glad he blocks for me. Amen. I'm glad he's not in front of me. I confess him. He said, if you confess me, I'll block for you. But if you don't confess me before me, I can't block, I won't block for you. In other words, confess me before others, and I've got your back, but if you marginalize, if you sideline me, uh, or dismiss me, you got your own back. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. Be baptized into Christ, and your sins will be forgiven, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my God. Will be given. Yes. Yes. We could take all day talking about the comfort that we get yes. from the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. When your soul is troubled, yes. that Holy Spirit, yes. it'll give you a resolve yes. that you didn't know you had. Can anybody test me? With that Holy Spirit, I can't see it. But I know the power and the effect of the Holy Spirit. When that Holy Spirit is working inside of you, which we have, you can do what you never thought you were able to do. Oh my God. That Holy Spirit, it comforts you as you go through the vicissitudes of life because you can be up today and it's something about that human emotion that, that within five minutes you can be down. Does, does anybody know what I'm talking about? And, 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 and you don't even know why. What, what, what's wrong with you? I don't know. It's just something uh, is wrong with me. Well, what is it? Are you sick? No, I'm not sick. It's just something in my spirit. Yeah. And, but then you get to pray, yeah, that's right. and pretty soon you get a phone call. Right. <sighs> you check the mailbox, and there's a car in there. Yeah. Or, 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 or you deal with something, and then right along through there, you're hearing it. Somebody call you on your cell phone, and it curves. You get a text on your phone, just and it lifts your spirit, and you say, I know it had to be nobody but the Lord. Of God working in the life of a believer. I'm so glad I have Christ. I don't know what to do. And maybe you're here and you recognize I, 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 I want to come under this headship here. I want to come under the rulership of Christ. I want to give my life to Jesus. And I've waited long enough. How much more time does God have to give you? For you to recognize this world is not your home. What, what, what? Do you need a year? Do you need a month? You already know. This old world is passing away. And we're hastening to a grave. 
if the Lord doesn't come back before me. And so now is the time to get your house in order. Young people, get your house in order. I've done plenty of funerals for young people who thought they had the rest of their life to get their life together. All right. But little did they know, we're not promised to live to 100 years old, 40, 30, or even 20. You got a lot of little graves, as many as there are big graves. And so to the young people, get your house in order. To the middle age who are trying to make it in life, what, what would it profit a man? If he should go and gain the whole world and lose his own soul. To the senior saint, to the aged, you, you've seen the vicissitudes of life. You lost friends and you know that your body is aching. Get your house in order. Because every ache and every pain, every headache, every cold, every toy, every doctor visit is a sign that we're hastening, we're hastening on. If you're here and you just want prayer, I just, I just want prayer, Brother Preacher. I want somebody to call my name. I've been praying, I know I can pray, but, but, but I just want somebody to pray with me and for me. Won't you come? Won't you come right now? Even in the back, in the middle, in the front, while together we stand and sing the song of invitation. While together we stand. Come right now. While together we sing the song of invitation. Come right now.